Watching a Saturn V launch is still an awe-inspiring sight, but there's far more going on than meets the eye. The Saturn V was far too complicated to fly by hand, but contrary to popular belief, it wasn't the Apollo Guidance Computer or AGC in the command module doing the job. It was a completely different computer, and one which would probably have a bigger impact on modern computers than the AGC. So what was flying the Saturn V rocket? Now, as we know, the computers used in the Apollo missions were just a fraction of the power of modern smartphones. And to many, they just can't believe that you could get to the moon and back with so little computing power, but they did. In fact, you don't need a massive computer to fly a rocket. In fact, you don't need a computer at all. Well, not in the way that we think. The V2, the ancestor to the Saturn V, used gyroscopes linked to graphite veins that sat in the rocket's exhaust to steer it, and accelerometers that cut the power when it reached a predetermined height. As the distance and heading to the target was already known, the rest is pretty much physics following a trajectory curve, the same as firing artillery shell. But of course, the Saturn V was in a completely different league and much, much more complicated. So whilst it's doing a similar thing of going from its place of launch to a predetermined point above the Earth at a certain speed, there's a lot of extra details, and ultimately the lives of the astronauts were also at stake. It's not just the flying of a rocket that had to be done, but also things like monitoring of all the systems, telemetry between the rocket and the ground, and the emergency detection system to name a few. This was all housed in a special section called the Instrument Unit, or the IU. This was a ring-shaped section located between the third stage and the section that held the command module and the lunar lander. This ring measured 91 centimeters high and 6.6 .6 meters in diameter. In here was the Launch Vehicle Digital Computer, or the LVDC. Then the Analog Flight Control Computer, that would take the signals from the LVDC and control the engines and flight controls. A stable gyroscopic platform, accelerometers, radar, telemetry, and four silver zinc batteries to power the electrical systems. When the Saturn V launched, it would switch control from the ground computer to the LVDC to run a pre-programmed routine that would put it in the correct position to roll the rocket to point it in the desired direction. Once in orbit, ground stations would track its position and speed so that the correct coordinates an engine burn duration time could be transmitted from mission control to the LVDC for the translunar injection. The LVDC also controlled and kept the third stage steady whilst the command module performed the transposition and docking procedure of the lunar module once the vehicle was on course for the moon. During the launch, over 200 parameters were transmitted back to monitor vital systems as well as communications with the crew. The rocket's attitude and speed were also monitored so that any slight deviations in the flight path could be detected and corrections sent back to the LVDC. Now, when we see the Saturn V, it looks like one large, sturdy structure, but in reality, the Saturn is really a collection of fuel tanks held in three stages stacked on top of each other with powerful rockets at the base of each all held together by an external framework which also had to be as light as possible. The combined total of these tanks held thousands of tons of liquid fuel and oxidizer, all subject to the forces of gravity and acceleration. They'd also changed their mass considerably from their launch to the separation just a few minutes later. This made the vehicle aerodynamically unstable as the fuel was used up and the center of pressure and mass changed during the flight. The body of the Saturn was also like a flexible tube that would bend at frequencies from about 0.3 to 4 Hz as it reacted to the sloshing of the fuels and the thrust from the engines. The flight control system had to take this into account when adjusting and gimbling the engines so that positive feedback loops didn't build up, which could lead to the bending oscillations becoming so strong that they could damage the framework and ultimately break up the rocket. To help avoid this happening, the LVDC ran a major computational loop 
for vehicles guidance once every two seconds and a minor computational loop 25 times a second to control its attitude. These timings were chosen so that they wouldn't coincide with the slosh and bending mode resonant frequencies. To highlight why this was so important, you only have to see another structural but unrelated issue that occurred called the pogo effect and resonant vibrations in the fuel piping. This is something which was well known about in rocket design and was particularly bad on the unmanned test flight of Apollo 6. The phenomenon is called pogoing because the whole rocket starts to vibrate longitudinally or up and down the length of its body, like a pogo stick. On the Apollo 6, the vibrations caused some damage to the lunar lander docking structure, even though one wasn't on board and was so strong that it very nearly aborted the mission. A J2 engine on the second stage also failed due to a ruptured fuel pipe caused by resonant vibrations and the wrong engine was shut down because of a mix-up in the electrical wiring. The pogo effect occurs if there are sudden changes in acceleration due to variations in the engine's thrust. The fuel acting under the effect of gravity can move up or down, either decreasing or increasing the pressure in the fuel lines and thus affecting the thrust of the engines. This can become caught in a cycle of slowing and surging acceleration, which flexes the entire rocket body. If the frequency of this surging matches the resonant frequency of the rocket, a positive feedback loop can occur and the amplitude of the vibrations increases so dramatically that they can severely damage or even destroy the rocket. The main cause of it in the Apollo 6 incident was tracked down to the flexing of the X-shaped cross member which held the F1 engines, as well as the fuel pipes resonating and causing fuel pressure variations which started the whole process. Because the power of the computers was nothing like we have, things that would be done in software now had to be performed by discrete electronic circuits like resistor capacitor networks and delay lines when processing the signals that were received from the gyroscopes, accelerometers and other sensors before their values were processed by the computer. Again, this was done to remove the buildup of resonant frequencies between the rocket structure and the computer's processing loops. The LVDC computer itself was also a major step forward and operated in an entirely different way to the Apollo guidance computer which was built by MIT. The LVDC was built by IBM and not dissimilar to one of their commercial computers but with many architectural changes. Whereas the AGC was designed to be crash proof by rebooting back to the same state it was just before the crash, the LVDC had built-in triple redundancy. Basically, every computation was done on three identical logic systems, split into seven consecutive pipelines. The three results from each stage would be compared against each other by a voting system. If all three were the same, then the result would be passed on to the next part of the pipeline. However, if there was an error and one of the three results were not the same as the others, then that one would be ignored by the voting system and the results from the other two agreeing logic units would be used instead. By using this method, the likelihood of an error in the calculations due to hardware was greatly reduced. In fact, one third of a computer could fail and it would still operate correctly. Something else that the LVDC did was to compare the current results of a calculation to the last known good value or what IBM called the zero and reasonableness test. If the result of a sensor or a critical calculation suddenly went to zero or it jumped to a much larger value than the previous one in the computational loop, it would ignore this new data and use the last known good value instead. This was done so that false data from a faulty sensor, for example, or a computational error wouldn't be applied to the flight controls as a sudden large change could cause the rockets to become unstable. The stated reliability of the calculations done by the LVDC was 99.6% for a 250 hour mission or 99.9966% for a six hour mission. Something which helped this was the way it was built. It used newly developed integrated circuit or logic units as they were called. These contained a transistor or two diodes and a resistor, 
and were surface mounted onto through hole plated multi-layer printed circuit boards. In fact, the boards from 1966 look remarkably like modern PCBs with surface mount components and 12 layers in the PCB. Something that wouldn't become commonplace in modern computers for decades and shows just how far ahead this system really was. One thing that was common between the LVDC and the AGC was the memory. They still used magnetic cores. The LVDC having 32 kilobytes of RAM and a clock speed of 2 megahertz, giving it a speed of 12,190 instructions per second. A modern PC, by comparison, is about a million times faster. A total of 40,000 silicon semiconductors and resistors were contained in the simple ICs, which made up the main processor. The PCBs that made up the LVDC were mounted into a magnesium frame, and the chassis had liquid cooled walls to help dissipate the 138 watts that the computer used. Should there have been a problem with the first stage in some way, there was the Emergency Detection System, or the EDS. This could do one of two things. If it detected an imminent breakup of a craft, it would trigger the automatic abort sequence. If it was less serious, it would notify the crew for them to take the appropriate action. But once the abort sequence was triggered, it was irrevocable and would run to completion. The last procedure that the LVDC performed was once the vehicle had reached the moon. This was to keep the undocked third stage and the instrument unit away from the command module. On Apollos 13, 14, 15, 16 and 17, they were also directed to crash onto the surface of the moon, not only to keep them from colliding with the command module as it orbited the moon, but also to act as a seismic event that would be monitored by seismometers that had been left by previous missions. So, whilst the LVDC was the unglamorous counterpart to the Apollo guidance computer, its job was probably even more essential. So thanks for watching and don't forget to check out some of our other videos if you get the chance and also don't forget to subscribe, thumbs up and share.